Hmm, there it is. Well, it's Hebrew as the oldest alphabet. I just have the wrong uh, title there for you. Um, the presentation at this session is going to be connected to the book that I just published in uh, the month of January 2017. The publisher is Carta out of Jerusalem, and it's a great thrill to be published uh, by an Israeli publisher because this book is for the Hebrew, pe the Israeli people more than anyone else in the world. Uh, the title of it is The World's Oldest Alphabet, Hebrew as the Language of the Proto-Continental Script. Um, I have actually a copy here, and I'm going to pass it around for everyone in the room to take a look at. Thank you, Marissa. Um, and this is the result, literally, of thousands and thousands of hours of research and writing and computer drawing and editing. I can't tell you how much time and effort went into this work. Well, here's the story. For about 150 years, scholars have known which is the world's oldest alphabetic script. They've known, and almost all have agreed, that it's a Semitic script. So there's a Semitic language behind it. But the disagreement begins with what Semitic language is it? And there really haven't been many theories presented over the 150 or so years of research, except for one notable exception in the 1920s. A German scholar named Hubert Grimme proposed that this is Hebrew. Now, at the time, the letters of the alphabet, which are all based on pictographs, which are pictures drawn that represent a single consonantal sound, like b, g, r, or s. And because at the time, not enough certainty was known about all of the letters that he made some assumptions and some new proposals that weren't correct, and he made some wild translations of, uh, of his inscriptions. Well, the result is that he was ostracized. He was not respected by his peers after that, and his theory fell into disrepute. Uh, the ironic part is that he was exactly right in identifying it as Hebrew. In fact, uh, in my dedication in the book, he's one of the people that I um, dedicate the book to because he should receive the credit. He was the first to make that proposal, not I. Uh, this, um, uh, the research into this field, though, from his time until now, has developed in such a way that some of the disputed letters have been identified with clarity and with certainty and new proposals have been produced. So um, some work has continued. A few words have been translated, such as the word El, which is the name for king of the gods in one inscription, um, the, the name Baalat, which is the she Baal, you know, of Baal and Asherah, um, the two gods, the, the god and his female consort, whom the Israelites had this uh, relationship with, where they replaced the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the worship of Baal. Well, his consort at some other sites in the northern Levant was named Baalat, the she Baal, uh, the lady or the queen of Byblos, for example. And that's uh, one of the uh, patron deities at Byblos, one of the trading sites that actually that Egypt had uh, from the Levant. So outside of those few words and those improvements in, in the identification of some of the letters, really there wasn't much work that has been accomplished in cracking the code, in finding out which language this is, and in translating the inscriptions. So imagine this. Inscriptions have been sitting there for decades, not translated. Well, um, through my research, which began in January of 2012, I stumbled into evidence for Israelites in Egypt and followed the archaeological trail. In my last presentation, just completed a few moments ago, I demonstrated to them that we have archaeological and epigraphical evidence, epigraphical meaning ancient writings or inscriptions, to identify Jacob, Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Manasseh's obscure son Shechem, all virtually beyond dispute, and all fitting together perfectly with biblical chronology. 
tying the Israelites back to a 19th century BC movement, um, uh, uh, leaving of, of Canaan and arrival in Egypt at the site of Avaris. So within all of that discovery, was identifying a number of inscriptions written by Manasseh, Joseph's older or oldest son, that uh, were inscribed down, uh, down at a site in Sinai called Serebit El Khadim. And they would travel down there from Egypt on, on virtually annual mining expeditions to extract this lucrative turquoise for the industry that they were to have with um, exploiting it and then selling it on the open market. And it's one of the things that, that God used to allow them to become rich, to be quite frank. So that's God's blessing on, on his covenant people. Well, in that, on one of the inscriptions that he wrote, and most of the inscriptions were in Middle Egyptian, that's hieroglyphics, the, the, the first minor of my PhD from the University of Toronto, um, I saw in one of the captions above uh, a drawing that there were two pictographs that were not Middle Egyptian hieroglyphs. And I, when I saw them, scratched my head and said, what in the world are these? Um, I consulted a, a colleague who's from Australia and teaches in New Zealand, uh, who's a generation ahead of me, and I said, his name's Brian Coles, and I said, Brian, what are these two oddballs here in this Middle Egyptian caption? And he said to me, well, that's very easy. This one is a Canaanite syllabic. We get our word syllable from a syllabic, like ba, be, bi, bo, et cetera, ra, re, ri, ro. And the other one is a proto-consonantal letter. It's one of the earliest attested forms of the alphabetic letters. And that launched me on a study to catch up on 150 years of scholarship so that I could be up to speed with all of the literature and all of the theories and all of the, the ideas about what, this, what was the language behind this script. Yet I now knew, because on that same, with that same caption was a drawing, and, and a man named Chebeded, whose name means he who was disfavored, I've identified with argumentation that I, again, explained in the last uh, session, that this is Manasseh. And Chebedad means he who was disfavored. Well, what happened to Manasseh? Favor was taken away from him at the moment that Jacob um, was about to die, and he was giving the blessing, and he gave the greater blessing, the blessing of the birthright, not to the oldest, to Manasseh, but to Ephraim, his younger brother. So Manasseh had blessing taken away from him. He had favor removed from him. And so his Egyptian name, Chebedad, reflects that very thing. So from that inscription, I knew this was Hebrew, that, that the oldest attested Hebrew letter was written by the, one of the sons of Joseph. And it makes perfect sense. Ephraim and Manasseh were born and raised where? In Egypt. And they were born with a father who was second in command, the vizier. They would have had all of the rights and privileges that come with a father who is second over all of Egypt. They would have known and learned written Middle Egyptian hieroglyphic language. So when they uh, moved to the city of Avaris, and they moved there in 1859, because at that same time, Jacob said to Joseph, as for your other children, Joseph, they are yours, but these two, Ephraim and Manasseh, are mine. So he physically was removing them, causing them to live with their uncles, Ephraim and uh, with, with their, their uncles, the brothers of Joseph, and they lived out the rest of their lives there. So think about it. It was absolute brilliance on Jacob's part to do this, knowing that this would help his, his other sons adapt to this new environment of Egypt with a different culture, a different language, different methods, uh, different tools, different architecture, all of this. So Jacob knew with great foresight that to bring Ephraim and Manasseh to live there with their uncles would completely change the day for the plight of the Israelites in Egypt. So 
without all the being true, I went back knowing, armed with the knowledge that Hebrew is the language behind the world's oldest alphabetic script. I went back to the inscriptions that have been sitting there waiting to be translated with the knowledge that this is Hebrew. And I went ahead and worked on identifying as many um, and, and assigning the right um, uh, Hebrew letter to every pictograph that's already known and, and agreed upon by scholars, and then um, working through the disputed letters by process of elimination, testing out the different theories that are there. So inserting, you know, wherever you would find a certain pictograph, and one one author, uh, one one scholar said this is the r sound, and another said it's a g sound. I would try one, then try the other, and everywhere where that same pictograph was, I would try the one and the other. So by process of elimination, I weeded out the wrong views on how to identify that letter. That being the case, I then, having uh, figured out all of the uh, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, was able to translate 15 of these inscriptions with uh, requiring great time, great effort, and some um, fellow uh, careful students of the Hebrew language to be able to check my work for me. So then I published my book, um, and we're going to be looking at a few of the inscriptions there, not really trying to prove much to you, but mainly just showing you the evidence and, and what it tells us and how it interacts with biblical history. Can we find inscriptions, can we find in these inscriptions um, either evidence to support biblical history and biblical chronology as we know it, or would it, on the other hand, undermine it or attempt to refute it? How would that go? And I just wanted to, you know, I had no ax to grind. I just wanted to follow the evidence where it went to translate the inscriptions faithfully, not making them what I wanted them to say, but what with all likelihood the original author would have intended. And of course, the difficulty, well, there's a lot of difficulties with it. One of the difficulties is there are no vowels in their language. That makes it hard. In English, if we have um, b and d together, that could be bed, bid, bad, bode, b-o-d-e, or a number of other options. So you have to then look at all of the options in Hebrew, what that could be without vowels. Another problem is all of the words are composed in such a way that it's all of the letters are back to back, continuous script, we call it. So there's no division between words. In English, we divide our words, and that helps us to read the words. Imagine if those dividers went away. That would be difficult. So um, I had the task of working with these inscriptions that had all of these um, hindrances to making the translation work easy. So let's look at a few of those inscriptions. Now, as I said, uh, 1876 is the year that Jacob moved his family down into Egypt. 1446 is the year of the Exodus when they leave Egypt. And we're going to look right now first at just a couple of inscriptions from what's called the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. And this is the 12th dynasty for one inscription, the 13th dynasty for the second. So 1842, actually Sinai 115, we'll look at that first. That's the one I was telling you about, where we have the oldest attested Hebrew letter in an, in a, an otherwise mostly Middle Egyptian inscription. Then 1840, only two years later, we have our oldest attested, full-blown Hebrew inscription. Located very close to Sinai 115 at Serbit El Khadim, uh, but that one's located, uh-oh, 1840. That's, this, this isn't right. It's not Serbit El Khadim, it's at a site called Wadi Nasib, which is the uh, water source for Serbit El Khadim. So it's only, uh, I forget, a mile or two away, something like that. And then there are other inscriptions, such as Sinai, 1, um, Sinai 377, um, and actually the date on that, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, Sinai 377 is, is the... Uh, Hebrew inscription, uh, fully Hebrew, um, proto constantinople Hebrew inscription from Wadi Nasib. Sinai 100 is a Middle Egyptian inscription, um, and that um, 
I simply note because there, there, there are some issues with the paleography that help us to identify Sinai 115, one of the letters correctly, which is that protoconsonantal letter. So 1834 is when we have two inscriptions from a site called Wadi El Hol, that's in Upper Egypt, way to the south in ancient Egypt, and it was located in a position where the Nile River, which flows to the north, wound around it and then up. So it, it, it had the benefit of being high in elevation and then overseeing a, a large uh, stretch of the Nile River, so they made a military outpost there. That's Wadi El Hol, and there were many Middle Egyptian inscriptions there and many later inscriptions from other, uh, uh, with, with other languages uh, throughout antiquity, but there were two very clear proto-consonantal Hebrew um, inscriptions found at Wadi El Hol. And in a previous session, I talked to uh, I, I talked about one. In 1831, we have the Lahun bilingual ostracon. And that is from the site of Lahun, which I've argued elsewhere, is the first site to where Joseph moved to when he was elevated in Egypt to second in command. The first task he had was to produce grain for the coming famine. So he went to Lahun, which he turned into, it's like a valve, right? He built a dike there that, that routed, rerouted water from a, um, a parallel offshoot of the Nile River called the Bar Yusuf, and he rerouted that water into the Fayum. And you can look at a Google map today, and you will see, uh, you will see tan-colored desolate desert all around Egypt, except for the greenish uh, fertile area of the Nile River as it makes its way up to the delta and then it spreads out in the delta. Well, along that path, there's a left turn in the middle of nowhere and it's this huge vegetated area. That is the Fayum. And history knows, and every archaeologist, every Egyptologist will tell you this, who knows about the 12th dynasty, will tell you that the exploitation of the Fayum, meaning irrigating water there, for the, grow, the mass growing of, of grains began during the reign of Sesostris II, whom I identified in a previous session as the abundance pharaoh. So Joseph relocates to Lahun, opens a water valve, reroutes the water into the Fayum, turns it into a breadbasket for Egypt, and it stayed Egypt's breadbasket for millennia. That's the work of Joseph. So at Lahun, wouldn't you know, there is a proto-consonantal Hebrew inscription, which we won't be looking at, but is in my book, which is around there somewhere. Good. Um, what we will be looking at is Sinai 376. This is especially for the ladies. The, uh, the 15 inscriptions that I've translated contain three biblical figures. The first, chronologically, is a woman. Isn't that nice? Her name is Asnath. Does anybody know who Asnath is? Asnath? She is the wife of Joseph. And it was inscribed in 1772. So let's go ahead and look uh, at these two inscriptions. We'll come back to her inscription in a minute. First Sinai 115. This is mostly Middle Egyptian. It dates to 1842, and it contains the oldest attested proto-consonantal Hebrew letter. This is a picture of Sinai 115 with a color camera in recent decades. You can see, actually, there's, there's a, there, if you ever go to the site, Serebi, you'll know this Stella right away because a British person from the 19th century etched his name right here at the top. Talk about ugly graffiti, yeah. but it will help you peg Sinai 115. So you'll go right to it. So Sinai 115 is this eight to nine foot in inscription from right to left documenting the campaign of that year and it's year 18 of Amenemkat III. And at the base of it, you see barely uh, a donkey and a man on top and then a young boy to this side and one to that side. This is Sinai 115. Here's a black and white and you can see actually that the, the black and white, which was taken in the 30s, I believe 1930s, um, it's, the, the, the stella is much better preserved at that time. From then until now, it has suffered even more wind damage. 
which is very unfortunate. So this, just, this is actually not Sinai 115, but Sinai 112, and it just gives you a little bit of a feel for uh, what it looked like near the base of Sinai 115. So you can see text coming down in, um, in rows. And then uh, our picture is here, and here's the donkey, and here's the man on top, and here's the boy um, behind and, and, the, and the boy in front. And then typically with every one of these captions that Kebeded draws, and he's responsible in the years he goes down on these annual expeditions for the actual inscribing of the stele. So he would make the drawing, and then he would write a different caption every time. Well, in Sinai 1.12, he actually names himself here. Um, the translation is son of, um, not son of, ru uh, brother of the ruler of Rechenu, and that's the Egyptian name for the Levant, people who live in the Levant, such as Canaan. And then it gives his name, which is Chebeded M, and the M can drop uh, because that's Hebrew my nation. Um, it's, a, it's an optional uh, additional suffix that can be added, and it's not always found next to his name in all the inscriptions at Sirbit el Khadim. So back to Sinai 115, this is the lower register where the drawing is um, of, um, of Chebeded. And here is the inscription beginning from right to left, and it goes across, all the way across, and then a second row, and then one pictograph um, uh, in the third row, and one only. So how does this look? Well, I had to, because of the, uh, the opportunity to have several photos of it, I made a composite drawing. In other words, I electronically drew with PowerPoint, um, traced right over the photographs with, with three different photographs, every stroke that was possible to detect, and then compiled the best from all of those into a final product. Um, and that became the, um, the drawing um, of Sinai 115. Uh-oh, and did I forget to include it? Oh, my. I'm sorry. I forgot to include my actual drawing of Sinai 115, which is in the book that somebody has. But um, the reading of it is this. And maybe I'll just turn here. Uh, the reading of it is Ichen, Ichen, we, and this is the Canaanite syllabic. It's actually designed to look similar to an hourglass. But the meaning of the pictograph is instead an ingot, a metal ingot. So Ichen, we, and Ichen, we is the name that the Levantine people ascribe to themselves, whereas the Egyptian called them Rechenu. It's like, OK, I lived in Russia for 10 years. Um, I didn't call people who lived in Moscow Moscovites when I was there. I called them Moskvichi, a word you've probably never heard. It's because that's the word they assign to themselves as people who live in Moscow. I can't call them Moscovites. They'll look at me like, what word are you saying? So I have to speak in their language. Well, similarly, this Levantine person, Hebeded, who I'm identifying as Manasseh, he called and so actually the first word comes second. It's the adjective. It's the number six, six vertical strokes. There are six each and we, six people from the Levant. And they are, they are um, called each and we because it's a fellow Asiatic person calling them by that name. So he doesn't use the typical um, Egyptian use of the term, which is retinue. So six each and we. Then we have... Ivre and Hebrews of, and then Beth El, and this is House of the Earth God, and then the Meroglyph here, which is beloved. So all of that together reads six Levantine people, then in apposition, Hebrews of Beth El, the beloved. Beth El is the site that was the hometown of Jacob and his family, both when Joseph was hauled off into slavery in Egypt and when it was time for God to instruct them at the time of the famine to go down to Egypt. It was their home city. It's like for me, Akron, Ohio will always be my home city. LeBron James, he comes second. That's my home city. It'll always be Akron, Ohio. So for them, the same thing is true of Bethel. So romantically, he had a love and a 
a devotion and a loyalty to the site, to the city of Bethel, because that's where his father came from. And what's interesting is that he himself never lived there. And yet for him, it was just as dear of a city as it was to his father. So that was their beloved hometown. 6.11's Hebrews of Bethel, the beloved. And here, by the way, is that, um, that oddity, which I recognize right away. That is not a hieroglyph. What in the world is this? It is a square, mostly square. And that's actually a little bit... Um, uh, it's a little bit, uh, uh, what's my word? Elongated, uh, ho not ho rectangular. rectangular, thank you. It's a little bit rectangular with the long end going vertically, just slightly. And so that is a house. Uh, this, believe it or not, it's the drawing of a house. And that represents the B sound, the B sound, because in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for house is bayit. Bayit is house. So you don't pronounce the whole word bayit when you see the house. You just pronounce the B sound. And that became the beginning of this um, Hebrew alphabetic letter. So again, it was the stroke of genius and putting, and Jacob's putting Ephraim and Manasseh there. And they, they saw probably over time, or else it was the idea of their father Joseph. It's hard to say, but, but for sure they saw the need that their uncles had to be able to write their, their language and not just speak it orally. You needed a, pre, a written preservation of all that you've come to believe and all, that, all your history and all that's important to you. You need to be able to write this. So Ephraim and Manasseh took their knowledge of the 800 plus hieroglyphs in what we call the sign list of Middle Egyptian. And from it, they... Um, not arbitrarily, but they, they carefully chose 22 from among them to match all of the 22 consonants in the Hebrew language. And that's all they needed. They didn't need more than that. So those hi uh, hieroglyphs were essentially borrowed from the, from the Egyptians and applied to the spoken language of Hebrew, a Semitic language, different than Egyptian, and off they went and they were able to write all of their history. Wouldn't you know when you look in the book of Genesis, which account is the longest one? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Joseph? Joseph, right? Well, it's his sons who originate the Hebrew text, uh, the Hebrew script. So they were able to be firsthand witnesses and probably, I can't prove it for sure, probably wrote down a lot of the history that finds its way into the later part of the book of Genesis. So, um, my alphabetic chart, which is right in the beginning of the book, and I put it there purposefully so that the reader can just, you know, open it right to that chart and figure something out, and really, so that other scholars can maybe, after I'm dead and gone or whatever, or busy doing other things, can go after other inscriptions that haven't been translated, and they themselves can do the work of translating that text if they know uh, um, a, a biblical Hebrew to a decent extent, if they um, have a lexicon, a Hebrew lexicon at their hand, which is a dictionary, and then a knowledge of a few of the rules of the Hebrew uh, that, that goes back into the, uh, the period of epigraphical Hebrew before biblical Hebrew. So in this chart, I chart out um, a number of important things. On the far left column going down is the Hebrew alphabet. If you've studied Hebrew, you know that right away. Um, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, etc., etc., as you go down. The next column is what I suggest is how it originally looked as the, the, the pictographs um, established by Ephraim and Manasseh as the, um, the first form of the Hebrew script. The third column from the left is the hieroglyphic precursor, the, the exemplar, from which they borrowed the way to draw that. So again, they applied their knowledge of, of Middle Egyptian and simply copied out in their own handwriting, if you will, their own style, how they would draw a certain object. So that um, the, uh, let's say, the, the ideal form of uh, let, uh, the letter we know as, as hey, the H sound, 
It looks like a man. It lo actually, it looks like a, a football official, right? The zebras. Making the touchdown pose, six points. That's what it looks like. So that's the original uh, hieroglyph. And then this is how he uh, Hebedad, whom I'm saying is Manasseh, actually wrote that hieroglyph in Middle Egyptian on Sinai 92. So I borrowed that to show um, how he himself was drawing it. Then this column gives you, uh, the in, in Hebrew, the written form of the original word behind it. So in some cases, I agreed with what everybody has always assumed is, is the right Hebrew letter. But in other cases, I've had to say, no, what we've always thought we've known to be the original Hebrew letter, it doesn't match. Perfect example is what we would say is the letter G, the third letter, known as Gimel. Gimel doesn't work for the pictograph. What's the pictograph? Ideally, it's like a right angle based on the See how the letters are written over time. And so this column is Joseph's lifetime, the Middle Kingdom, dynasties 11, uh, 12 and 13. This is the New Kingdom of Moses' lifetime and a little bit beyond. And this is uh, the way that the Hebrew letters were written during the period of the judges all the way to the um, Babylonian captivity in 587. So obviously, I only had a small amount of, of options that I could include here. It, it, this column, this last column, could easily be this wide. Um, but what this shows you is, is not, among other things, is the evolution of, of every letter. So, for example, we've been talking about the, the hay let, what's, what's called the hay letter. Well, actually, that hieroglyph means a couple things. It means someone that's high, it means something that's high, or it can mean jubilation. Well, the Hebrew word for jubilation, if you look at the verb, is halal. That's to jubilate, to praise. And that is what's behind the Hebrew use of that hieroglyph. So that the Hebrew word halal is the meaning behind the pictograph. So when someone sees the touchdown hieroglyph, the first thing that comes to mind is praise or, uh, or jubilation. Or, or to jubilate. So they see that, and they know that that word halal starts with an H, so they make the H sound, huh. Well, over time, uh, the form of that language would change. You see here in the Wadi Ohol inscriptions, um, it's a little bit less complex. We don't have two legs anymore. We have this wiggly thing for the legs. It's like the two legs are joined together, and they're made with almost right angles to go down to the feet. Um, here, they actually they change the touchdown pose. It's no longer six points. There's one arm here and one arm here. That's just an anomaly. It's really nothing of significance. Then you see, once again, now during the lifetime of Moses, the head is no longer large and well-drawn. It's just dotted at the most. Um, the arms are very simple. You're just drawing like a, a, a U with a very little bend in it. And then... Um, uh, in some cases, the legs are even more simplified, or in the case of Sinai 374, the legs are gone altogether. Then, if you were to take this, turn it 90 degrees like that, get rid of the dot for the head, you come up with what looks like our letter E, right? Looks like an E, but it's not an E. It's one arm, and then, or actually one forearm, and then the base of that arm, and then the base of the other arm, and then the forearm of the second arm. And then this is the neck right here. So you can see the evolution of the language as it becomes, or the script, I should say, as it becomes less and less and less pictographic. Why would that happen? It's a natural process. Number one, if the Hebrews were like I am, they're terrible artists. I couldn't draw all of these letters very well at all. I couldn't do it. I would need something really simple. So over time, the pictographic element lessened as, as they wanted to draw or write faster and faster and faster. So, they, so, they, uh, so the letters themselves turned toward abstract. And once everybody knew how a letter would look in an abstract way, it would be easy to, um, 
to understand the significance of a letter. I mean, how do we know, writing English, what, what makes us know that that's the letter E? It's just constant exposure to seeing a, a letter written like that to know it's letter E. Well, the same thing would have happened with them. As time went along, it became abstract. You could hardly see what was the pictographic value behind it. It didn't matter because you know how the letter is drawn. So um, all of this work, again, is part of the thousands and thousands of hours that went into it. This is one of the most important components in the entire book. And the, here's the bottom of the alphabet. So then Sinai 376. This is what I promised you as the um, oldest inscription with a biblical figure named on it. Um, so here's the historical background. Then Pharaoh named Joseph uh, Zapanath Peneah, and he gave him Asnath, the daughter of Potiphera, a priest of Heliopolis, as his wife. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asnath, the daughter of Potiphera, a priest of Heliopolis, bore to him. And then go down in Genesis 46.20. Now Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph in the land of Egypt, whom Asnath, the daughter of Potiphera, bore to him. So that's who she is. Well, this is the inscription. It's known as um, Sinai 377. Originally it was called uh, Gerster 1, I believe, um, or at one time. But now it's known as Sinai 376. And you can see on this rock inscription, someone has, has inscribed or, or carved into the stone wall um, certain strokes. They're not st always straight strokes, but they reflect um, the drawing of letters. So I had to work with um, this and one or two other uh, photos. And then every scholar's uh, hand drawing of it that I had at my exposure um, had at my disposal, and I came up with what was my own drawing of all the letters. And I included some of the, um, the rough marks in the stone to show a little bit of what the stone was like as well. And then you take away the, the image, and you're left with all of the letters um, and some of the rough marks that were on that inscription. So when working with the inscription, I came to know it reads, OK, and, and Hebrew, uh, proto-continental Hebrew, follows Middle Egyptian hieroglyphic in that it will only write in one of three ways. They will. Top to bottom. Uh, let's see, this is your left. Left to right or right to left. Never to a bottom to top. Never in, in Egyptian and never in Hebrew. So I came to know this reads top to bottom, beginning with the row on the right. So it's first row, second row, third row, fourth row, and then there's a single letter in the fifth row, which is um, an arm, a hand. Uh, let's see, no, it is, I'm sorry. It is um, an upper arm, a little bit of an upper arm, then the whole lower arm, the four fingers as one, and then the thumb. So that's what you have uh, for the fifth column, only one letter. This inscription is absolutely phenomenal. It reads, the house of the vineyard of Asnath and its innermost room were engraved. They have come to life. Now, what does that mean? Well, when I lived in Russia, virtually every um, upper generation Russian, let's say, had what's called a dacha. It's a summer garden house. And they would go there so that they could grow vegetables that they would store for the winter and use throughout the winter and the spring. That would supply them for a year, especially potatoes and several other vegetables. Well, evidently, they had a similar thing back in earliest Israel's time where they would have, in, in this sense, uh, in this case, the garden wasn't vegetables per se. It was a vineyard. So they were growing grapes. Well, in the Levant, the growing of grapes and the producing of wine was one of the main indus industries. So they would have known how to produce uh, wine in great abundance with great ease. So what we have is, this is like a dacha. This is like a summer house. So it's the house of the vineyard of, As, of Asnath. And that is the, the wife of 
Joseph. Now, chronologically, this dates to 1772, and Asnath would have been about 130 years old at this time. So we don't know for sure how long she lived, but probably she was deceased by now, most likely. That being the case, the name Asnath is written what we call posthumously, after her death, but in her honor. So it's a, it's a house that was built in connection with the vineyard, and the vineyard is named after Asnath. Remember I've told you, especially in other sessions, that Ephraim and Manasseh came to oversee the homestead after Jacob's death at Avaris. Joseph is off doing his thing with Pharaoh. He's second in command. So Ephraim and Manasseh take over at Avaris. Ephraim is the ruler there. He becomes the mayor, and they run the city among all of the other brothers of Jacob. They are sovereign there. They're the big shots. That being the case, it's not surprising that their mother is honored in such a way that the, the vineyard is named after her. And that vineyard had a house where somebody would go to be able to manage the vineyards kind of like day and night to watch over them, to guard them, and also to prune them or water them or take care of them during the day. Obviously, if you, if you live back in the city, you have to travel to and from every day for several miles or whatever the distance is. So to have a house there right where the vineyard is would make it easier. So this house was beautified. How was it beautified? Well, the house itself and the innermost room were engraved. That means they were carved in some way with some kind of drawings that made them pretty. It's like in our houses. We don't leave bare walls like you see in this room. That's not so beautiful. You want to put something on there that, that shows beauty. And also, you know, doesn't allow the sound to bounce around the, house, around the room. So you would beautify each, you know, most or each one of the walls in your room. And this is what they did with that house. They beautified it by engraving it. And they engraved not only the house itself, but the innermost room. And that fits the architectural style, as I've talked about in other sessions, where the tripartite house which was the architectural style in Levant, was used by Jacob when he moved to Egypt and he built his house according to that very style. Of those uh, rooms in a tripartite house, the innermost room was the hardest one to get to, but it's the one where either the business was conducted or more likely, it's where they slept. That was their bedroom. That was their, their innermost room. So that was beautified with this engraving. And this is the same exact terminology we see. Three of the words are exactly the same as are found in the description, especially in 1 Kings 8, for the first temple, known to many as the Solomonic Temple. That was the bait, the house of, uh, of he who is. That's the covenant name of God. Just like the house of Asnath's Asnath vineyard. Well, the innermost room, Devir, is also... Um, spoken of as an innermost room that we call the Holy of Holies. That's where God dwelled, in the innermost room in the temple. Then the word for engraving, just as the, as the house and its innermost room were, were, were engraved, in, according to Sinai 376, much earlier in time, well, much later, a thousand years later or whatever, Solomon carved all of the temple's walls with engravings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, both with the inner and outer sanctuaries. So Solomon did the very same things with the very same architectural design as was used a thousand years earlier by the Israelites calling their house the house of the vineyard of Asnath. Beautiful connection to the Hebrew imagery of the first temple. Okay, now let's look at a few new king inscriptions. Actually, we're about out of time. So we're just going to look at one new kingdom inscription. Uh, okay, we'll make it um, Sinai 349. Um, Sinai 349 
is from the New Kingdom period. It dates to somewhere between 1480 and 1446. Uh, this is not a certain date at all that I have here for you. Um, well, in Exodus 1, 6, and 7, it says, Now Joseph died along with his brothers and all of his generation, but the sons of Israel were fruitful and teemed and increased and became exceedingly numerous, and the land was filled with them. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the midwives, and you know the whole story where they're going to kill the male boys. Down to the end, then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, saying, You are to cast into the Nile River every born son, but you will preserve every daughter. This is the infamous decree of the king of Egypt. Well, Sinai 349. Here is a look at one of the photographs of it. Very hard inscription to work with, especially the lower left. This took me longer than probably any other inscription uh, to be able to decipher. There were times that I had to change the magnification all the way up to 400% and look very carefully um, and, and try to discern the, um, the path that each of the letters was taking. Eventually, I filled it in like this, pulled away the picture, and here's what I'm left with. It's an inscription uh, that's lined, it's um, scored, and um, reads from right to left and top to bottom. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven full lines as we can read them. And here's what it says. My translation, he, some person known as he, he sought occasion to cut away to barrenness our great number. Sound familiar? Our swelling without measure. This word is used of a woman who becomes pregnant and she's just really welling out there in her abdomen area. They yearned, that is the Israelite people, they yearned for Hathor. Remember Hathor? She's the patron deity, the Egyptian goddess, the cow, associated with the cow, who's worshipped at Serebit El Khadim, where the Israelites at this time, some of them are working as slaves to extract turquoise. They yearned for Hathor. They didn't cry out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They cried out to Hathor. You know what it says in the book of Jeremiah? It says that before the, the Israelites left Egypt, they were already worshiping the gods of Egypt. Here is confirmation that that was true. They were worshiping Hathor. But the quiver, and a quiver is associated with what? Arrows or children, yeah. But their quiver, but the quiver of our brothers, the Hebrew people, was thoroughly despised. The king treated it with contempt. So he, whoever he is, performed terror against their quiver and brought about a cry of wailing. Is that not spectacular? Does that not fit Exodus? Where were we? Here, Exodus 1, 6 and 7, and 1, 15 to 17, and 21. Does that not fit it perfectly? He brought out a cry of wailing because he despised them. He then, uh, he then worked out in such a way that he sought occasion to cut them to barrenness, their great number. To cut them to barrenness is to take away their children. And the Bible already says that they were multiplying, right? They were like rabbits. It says several times in Exodus 1, they were multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Here it talks about their great number. They're swelling without measure. And now someone comes along, he, and desires to destroy them. He has to refer to Pharaoh. There's no one else with the power to give the executive order for this to happen to the Israelite people. And in one of the other inscriptions, Sinai 357, the king himself is named as being the person responsible for, um, for um, bringing devastation to the father of the man who writes the inscription. So the king is already mentioned in a different inscription. So the king of Egypt was, was, um, was responsible for this hideous act of 
of demanding that the, um, the Israelites' great number be squashed into virtually nothing. So we see a perfect confirmation of the account in the book of Exodus of the very thing that happened to the Israelite people that, um, that, that was so utterly devastating and wicked. The, ki the mass killing of baby boys to destroy their numbers. And there it is, right there in black and white, a, 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 a contemporary of the time, documenting this as he was down on a, on a mining expedition as a slave so that all of their posterity would be able to read it. For some reason, I do not know why, God has hidden all of this for 3,450 plus years, folks. He's hidden all of it. Now he's brought it to light. I think I understand a little bit about why he's doing it, but I can only barely scratch the surface in what I know. What I do know is he has many great things to do as a result. Number one among all of them is this. God did what he did with the Pharaoh and with his army and with Egypt and, and with their gods and the devastation and the plagues. He did it all to make his name known throughout the world. And if that is his stated goal, and it's stated that way in Scripture, you can read it in my book, you can read it in the biblical text, then is that not part of the reason why he's doing this today, to bring it all back? For God to make his name great on the earth, that all people would know he has done what he said he did. This book demonstrates to the, to the Jewish people that the stories they read about, about their history, that are most important to them, more important than any of their other stories, those stories are all true. The world is telling them. The university professors are telling them. The, the scholars, the biblical scholars are telling them. It's all fantasy. These inscriptions tell us it happened. God did what he did, and he did it to make his name great. Thank you.